Good morning. All right. Hey, um, thanks for being here with us this morning. And uh, you know, I hope you had a great weekend. I have uh, four grandchildren staying at my house. And you realize why you have your kids when you're really young. No, <laughs> it's, like, it's, been, uh, it's been great. And uh, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of miniature football games. Uh, but it's, it's good to be back here uh, together. Hey, uh, this morning, I want to start off, before we sort of dig into scripture, just acknowledging something that's really important. You know, 22 years ago, right about now, it was a Tuesday, and it was uh, my third year here at Gordon. How many of you were alive 22 years ago? All right, I see the six of you. Right, and that that's makes this even more important. Because the rest of you, you know, what I'm going to talk about here for just a few minutes is no different than anything else you're going to read in a history book or have heard over the years. But 22 years ago, um, right about now, on a Tuesday, classes were canceled at Gordon College. And our entire campus gathered in this room, weeping, frightened, and at a loss for words because it was September 11th and during the course of the morning our country was attacked and lots of innocent people died. Last night was the anniversary of the evening that 2,977 people had dinner with family and friends. And they had plans the next day to go to work in the World Trade Center, just like they do any other day. They had plans the next day to go work in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., just as they did any other day. They had plans to get on airplanes and fly from Boston to Los Angeles or from Newark to Los Angeles or Dulles in Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. People walk down the jetways just like all of us do, not thinking anything about that day. And they strapped into their seats for what will be their final ride. People in the towers were sitting at their desks when they saw Boeing 767s coming right for them. It was a really bad day. It was a really uh, important day for us to remember. You know, that day, those buildings were on fire and firefighters and police officers were climbing up through buildings that were burning and melting in an attempt to rescue people and thousands of people are alive because of their efforts. And they went up in those towers knowing that the towers likely, you know, it was not structurally sound. And many of them died right there. There was a student here at Gordon uh, played baseball with my son, who started after 9-11, uh, showed up here about three years later, played third base for Gordon Baseball. And myself and the other dads used to cheer a little bit louder for him because his father was a passenger on American Flight 11, the first one to hit the World Trade Center. And so his dad wasn't here to watch him play baseball. You know, people were just simply living their lives. You know, when you go to the airport and the lines are long at TSA, don't complain. They're doing their job. They're doing their job so that you don't have to worry about a day like that happening again. There was no TSA until after September 11th. All right, so this morning, I, I don't want to start off by being somber, but I, I just want to start off by remembering, because 
that day changed our country, it changed the world, but it changed forever 2,977 families. And so every September 11th, as we remember the events of that day, 2,977 families remember the people of that day. So I'm going to ask us to pause for a moment of this moment of silence. And if you would pray for the families who now for the 22nd time have found their hearts broken as they remember this day. Father, we are grateful for the fact that you walk with us um, when life is good and when life is tough. Uh, Lord, we, we think this morning of the lives lost that day and the families who to this day live with that loss. Father, as we as a nation remember those lost, the heroes of that day, the people simply living their lives. Father, we pray that your spirit would be close by their loved ones um, on, this, uh, on this anniversary. Lord, may they find you near and may they find their, um, your love um, showered upon them by your Holy Spirit and those who know and love them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks. The, uh, this morning, I wanted, we're talking about God meeting us in the ordinary parts of our lives. Right? And so this morning, we're going to look at a pretty familiar passage of Scripture. And it's found from Luke chapter 5. And I'm going to have the CTS folks drive this thing because I don't have the clicker. All right? So um, let's stand and read this together. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Next slide. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon and Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. They pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Please be seated. You know, it's a pr very uh, sort of familiar passage, and we look at this and think, so what was the context here? This is early in Jesus' ministry. He had just um, spent time in the wilderness, and then he went to Nazareth, and he sort of hometown visit, and he starts reading the scriptures, from the scrolls, and he makes the declaration, basically, this is about me, which did not go over well with the religious rulers. Jesus then drives a demon out of a man, and now has the people's undivided attention, right? The most folks don't see that or do that. And then Jesus began to heal many people. So the word was out about Jesus and who he was, 
and curiosity was everywhere. So Jesus is traveling along, comes along near the lake, and the crowds were pushing around him and listening to him teach. Right, and then Jesus sees two boats that were there, and he got into one of the boats and asked them to push off from shore. You know, this summer, uh, my family and I, we, we were up on a lake up in uh, Chapley, Maine. In fact, we were just there again for Labor Day weekend, and the lake was really quiet. And there were people out on paddle boards in the middle of the lake, probably 200 yards from us, and we could hear their conversation as their words just skimmed across the water, which then made us think, oh, we should probably watch our conversation as they skim in the opposite direction. So Jesus understood the dynamics of the moment and he gets into a boat and he pushes it off and he begins to teach the people. Right, while this is going on, the fishermen, they had been washing their nets and there's nobody grumpier than a fisherman who's been skunked, right? And so they're washing their nets. Jesus asked them to push off from shore into deep water. And then when he finished speaking, he looks at Simon and says, I got an idea. Let's go fishing. Simon and the other fishermen got to be just like, you're kidding me. We, we, we just, like, did you not hear us say we caught nothing? Well, if you didn't hear that, let me say that. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But then this is a really interesting line that I want us to look at this morning. Simon has been skunked. He has been up all night. They listen to Jesus teach. And when Jesus says, put out into deep water and let down their nets for a catch, Simon, after he says, we haven't caught anything, says this, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. Isn't it interesting to look at this and think, like, what was it? that had Simon's attention? What was it about the words of Jesus that had this fisherman, not a religious ruler, decide, all right, I'm going to go for it. Jesus grew up the son of a carpenter. So all of a sudden, this guy who knows a lot about woodworking tells the fisherman how to fish. And, and so he, he challenges them to let down the net. They let down the net. And their response was they did exactly that. You see, in this encounter, it's really one of the first times in, in the New Testament that we see Jesus encountering people in their ordinary lives. Right. He, he encounters us each day and is there waiting for us to acknowledge the encounter. The encounter. Right? To, to believe that, that God can speak to us, that God can move in our hearts. And as a result, there's what are we going to do about that? How are we going to respond? The fishermen let down the nets. They were like, all right, Jesus, we're going to give you this much. We're going to, we'll, let, we'll let them down. Let's see what happens. You wonder if the fishermen rolled their eyes at each other like, well, so much for cleaning these things, but here goes nothing. Right? And they let down the nets, and the result was a huge haul of fish. A huge haul of fish. Now, this is Jesus encountering people right where they are. The question I would ask you, is there a time in your life where you can believe or feel or know or acknowledge that God encountered you right where you are? 
The fact that some of you are in this college is because God intervened in some miraculous way to open a door for you to be here. When I t talk to some of you, right, from time to time I'll ask, so how'd you find this place? I had someone the other day say, Google. Google. How many of you have found Gordon on Google? Thanks, Google. All right, what are, what are the odds of that happening? But God is at work. God is at work. You see, God is the God of divine appointments, and he wants, he is whispering in our ear all the time, meeting us in ordinary places. We need to just become people who look around and acknowledge that. My life changed. When I was a freshman here, I was a biology major. I was determined I was going to be a doctor. And believe it or not, Emory Hall, you know the little building that looks really tired? That's attached to McDonald's. It is really tired. And that used to be the science building before Ken Olson was built. All right. Science majors, wrap your head around that. I was in a, in a lab in there dissecting something that was dead. Right? And I, I remember this profound moment in my life where, you know, I, I don't hear God's voice like talking to me all the time. You know, it's not like you're a chaplain and you get a special connection. Right? I mean, I, I was there and I, I remember in the midst of my ordinary day doing my assignment, I had this sense of God speaking like almost audibly in my head saying, you are here working with something that is dead and will never be alive. And there are people who are alive and yet they're dead. I need you to do ministry. It was profound. I mean, I got up. My advisor was the professor. At the end of the class, I walked up and said, like, uh, uh, I, I think I'm supposed to change my major. Like, lightning bolt. Like, I think I'm going to do this. Right now, now, I could have said, like, no, no, no. I, you know, I had a bad breakfast. You know, this was just fog in my head. But God met me in the middle of a classroom and changed my life, changed my trajectory. Now, two things happened there that were necessary, A, for me to be listening, but also for me to respond. Right? Listening is easy. The responding part's the hard part. Right? That, that we have to get up and go do something with whatever it is that we believe that God is calling us to do. Now, I'm not saying everybody's got to be a pastor. No, there's plenty of pastors. If God calls you to be a pastor, be a pastor. God needs Christian doctors. God needs Christian plumbers. God needs sociologists. God needs all the things you study here. When you put them in the hands of God, God will open a path and make you a difference maker where he places you. But it calls for a response. The fishermen let down their nets and a huge haul of fish, so much that they're calling for help. You know, you want to get fishermen's attention? Catch fish in front of them. Catch fish in front of them. Up on this lake where I was, there's, there's two little docks. The dock that went with our house, and over here there was a dock, and there were two guys who were like fishaholics. I mean, they, they were out there 24-7 fishing, 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 fishing. And it would kill them when we would go out on the end of our dock. We'd throw in two lines. And one of the, now, how many of you have liked to fish? I see some of you out and about. There's nothing better than when you toss your hook out, the bobber's going, the hook goes in, the bobber follows it, and it never even gets a chance to float. Because the fish is on the line and it goes right under. And I remember that happened to me on Labor Day weekend. These two guys who were like fishing until they're going to drop, they just stood there and looked. 
Like, how is that fair? I had been out there for like three minutes. The fishermen, I believe, had sort of that same response. They suddenly are, have boats that are filled with fish. Filled with fish. To the point, Luke tells us they were almost sinking. And they head up towards shore. And Simon Peter couldn't help but fall at the feet of Jesus. This man who he had heard teaching and preaching, this man who was a carpenter and yet knew right where the fish were, and he falls on his knees and he says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You know what that's really very similar to? What you read in the book of Isaiah when Isaiah has this vision of the throne room of God. And he's like, woe is me. Like basically, what in the world am I doing here? I am not worthy. I am not worthy. And Peter's having one of these I, I am not worthy moments. He recognizes his sinfulness because he recognizes the godliness of this man in front of him. And Jesus says to Simon and to the others, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. You will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything and followed him. Left everything to follow him. You know, um, so their challenge was to follow, and their response was to leave the paycheck of their lives. Leave everything and, and walk along following Jesus. A question for us this morning is, are you allowing enough quiet in your hearts and in your heads and in your lives? Are you... You know, in, in the wrestling match for bandwidth on the wireless of campus, are you leaving enough bandwidth in your life for God to intervene? Enough quiet so that you can hear his voice. You know, one of the realities of campus that I see, and uh, you know, I, I walk along, and I'm, I'm a person who likes to say hi to people, like, hey, hi, hi, good morning, good morning, good morning. And people don't even hear my voice. Plugged in. You know, and it's fine to listen to things. But I want to challenge you to not fill your lives constantly with input from here. But make sure you allow enough quiet to get input from here. Get input from here. What is God calling you to? What is God calling you to? Who is God calling you to? You know, Jesus showed up personally there for the disciples and his teaching, God used that to impact their lives and for them to go all in. Jesus doesn't walk around and go tell people where to drop their nets anymore, even though fishermen pray for that. The Jesus that the world around us and the people around us are going to meet. It's going to be you and it's going to be me. As we live our lives for him, we are the hands and feet of Christ in the lives of those around us. Maybe the way we live our lives will reflect God's love enough to a person in a dark place for them to say, like, what do you have that I don't? 
and open the doors for a conversation about Jesus. You know, we, you have to want that. And I will give you a fair warning. If you were to pray and say, God, please open the door for me to share my faith with somebody this week, do not pray that prayer lightly. Do not pray that prayer lightly. Because God will meet you there. He will meet you there. Are you willing to be met? You know, God calls us, it's up to us to respond. And I want us to remember that there's urgency in this. When we live our lives and we interact with the people around us, there's urgency. We often think, well, I've got forever. You know, college age, I've got decades. I've got decades. I'll get around to that. 22 years ago, 2,977 people thought they had plenty of time. Urgency is what's needed. May we be a group of people here on the, on the North Shore who collectively let our light shine for Christ. That he might be seen in us and through us. Are we perfect? No. But are we redeemed? Yes. May God use us to change the world around us and to encourage one another as we walk through our ordinary lives with him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, this challenge in your word. Lord, may we live our lives with urgency. May we follow you with urgency. Lord, may we hear your quiet voice speak to us. May we give ourselves enough quiet to hear you over the din around us. So, Father, we, we give this week to you and pray that you would Give us the pleasure of being your hands and feet. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.